Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to season two of Friday Forecasting Talks. My name is Ivan. Uh, I'm a lecturer of Marketing Analytics at Lancaster University and a member of the CMAF. I'm a self proclaimed marketing director of CMAF. Um, to those of you who do not know, this idea of Friday Forecasting Talks uh, appeared. Um, last year during pandemic we thought that we want to keep in touch with other academics and with uh, practitioners and what would be the better format in the times when you don't have face to face uh, than to have webinars so we came up with that and we had last year 16 of webinars they happen every friday at every second friday at 2 p.m and uh, we as a center organized them. And here is the slide about the center. We have several professors. And we still have uh, Robert Files here, although he's officially retired recently. But uh, being retired from the university, he's still emeritus professor and he's still a part of uh, our center. So we cannot just remove him he from here. We also used to have Nikos Karanzis, but he moved to Sweden. He's still a dear friend of ours, and we still work with him. Uh, unfortunately, he's not officially the member of the center. Luckily, we have new faces now because we have Dr. Anna Srogin is joining us, and uh, she, is, has, she has joined uh, since uh, September, and we will have Dr. Magdi Abolkasemi, who will join us in January. So you see the group uh, changes experience expertise changes as well um, but uh, <laughs> friday forecasting talks stay with us now i wanted to say a couple of words about the the schedule of these events something that uh, we have organized so far so we will have six this term so till december and then we will have another six starting from january if you want to get in touch with us, there is a Twitter account, there is a LinkedIn account. Uh, you can send us an email. And we also have this fancy YouTube channel where we upload all the videos from uh, these, uh, these events. Right, so we have uh, Rebecca Killick today and uh, we actually decided to make this format uh, of talks even more exciting. So we asked our uh, Dear, dearest friend Nikos Kurendis to act as a discussant. So we will have uh, a presentation by Rebecca first, then we will move to comments from Nikos, and after that we will go to uh, questions and uh, answers session. So Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Ap apologies everyone for the, for the move to Zoom. It's, it's all my fault because um, I'm on Linux and Teams live events in Linux don't play well apparently. So ap apologies for that. Um, so just... today, um, can I just check, can everyone see my screen all right? Can you see the presentation? Okay, so um, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, identifying sequential changes in um, within the mean and variance within more complex model structures. And you're probably looking at the title going, how does this relate to forecasting? And it's one of these um, projects where um, forecasting wasn't our original goal, but we actually found some interesting insights. So I'm, I'm going to present the work to you as we discovered it. Um, and then you can kind of come along the journey with me in, in discovering the, the insights into, into forecasting um, as we discovered them. Um, so this is joint work um, with um, Ivan as well, and um, a PhD student that we jointly supervise called Thomas Grundy. So Thomas has now just finished and he now um, is employed at um, AO.com and his PhD was sponsored um, by Royal Mail and so Zhao, Shan and Michael are from Royal Mail so they gave us kind of some insights into, um, well they gave us the original challenge motivation and also some insights into some of the data I'm going to be presenting later. So I want to kind of start um, I know, you know, we're not in a room together, but I still would like some audience participation in this. Um, and, you know, just because we're on Zoom doesn't kind of get you off the hook. Um, so I'd really like it and um, feel free to unmute and, and just kind of come in whenever. How would you guys go about modeling this type of, of time series here? What are the key components that you can see that you think would have to be within a model? Seasonality, maybe? 
Yep, seasonality. Anyone else? Yeah, I would say there's a regime change around November, and I would tend to ignore the data to the left of that change and try to model the last bit of the series. Yep, I like that. You're picking up on the, on the title of the talk. So, yeah, well done. Any, anybody else for any more? Well, in principle, we don't know if this is trend or seasonality because we have uh, less than a year of data. So actually volumes, uh, the um, volume could go back to what was in April. Yep, Com completely right, yep. And so the things that I kind of picked up on with this um, is kind of looking at, you've probably maybe got some multiple seasonalities here. We can kind of see um, there's kind of some periodic behavior on, on a smaller scale, but also potentially, um, as, as someone pointed out, potentially um, seasonality, we don't know. It, it could just be a, tr a trend in the data uh, on the larger scale. So potentially you might want to put multiple seasonal frequencies in there. You might need some regressors. So we, we've got some potentially unusual observations around the kind of Christmas period here. Um, that, so maybe we might want some regressors for holiday periods in there. We don't really have Easter on this, so, so maybe not. Um, but yeah, we may want to put some, some things like that in. We may have some explanatory series that might be able to explain some of this variation or, or the trend that we're seeing. So we may want to put in some of those if we have them. And we may also want to put some kind of other lag dependencies, maybe some um, AR structure or MA structure or, or however you might want to, to characterize um, that kind of dependency on, on maybe the recent or, or long past, depending on whether we see any long memory behavior here. But the point is, we wouldn't just be fitting a kind of a normal distribution with a flat mean or something like that. We're looking at time series here. We're looking at potentially quite complex model structures that, that we might want to um, bring forwards. So somebody's already kind of noted that there may be maybe a break in the series here. So this is actually counts. So this is where the variance increases with, with the number of observations here. Um, but if, if I move to the second example here, this one has a much clearer um, break structure towards the end of the series. And I've deliberately removed all of the scales and everything on this because um, we'll, we'll come and visit this um, series again later when I'll give you a bit more context. But there's clearly kind of, you've got a trend, there may be a break towards the beginning of the series um, or um, towards the, the kind, of in, kind of within the first third and, the, and then after the second third uh, of the series where it looks like there's, there may be a break in the trend. But if we're having um, potentially complex time series like we've got here, potential complex modeling where we've got multiple seasonalities, lots of regressors, maybe some explanatory series, complicated um, error structures coming in. And we just want to look at fitting a change in trend here. That's really, really challenging because a lot of the techniques that will allow us to fit this change in trend automatically, of course, you can put a, a, another regressor in to take account of that, that change point if you know where it is. But if you don't and you're trying to automate this, maybe, you know, this is one of hundreds or thousands of series that, that you've got to manage yourself. And um, you don't have time to look at each one and, and see if, if it's got a potential change that's come into the data recently. So if we want to do this automatically, then the problem is that these complex model structures that we need to be able to capture the essence of what's, of what's kind of driving our, our, our data, um, it's really complicated just to put in a, a change in trend in that. There are no methodologies that are out there that can do that efficiently from a computational perspective. So that kind of brings into question, well, what, what can we do with that? So as I've kind of said, most of the methods need to be able to fit a model to after the change point. So that kind of set, if we're kind of thinking in, in a more online context where we might be doing some forecasting and, and we, we want to detect changes as, as, they, as our data kind of evolves, most of the methods that we look at uh, that we're able to fit to detect these changes need to be able to fit a model after the change point. And so what that does when we have quite complex model structures is it means that we need more data following the change in order to be able to actually fit a model. If you think about, you know, um, parameter identifiability and things like that, you need at least the number of parameters, if not, um, you know, more, more than that to be able to accurately identify um, the structures within, within that model. And when we're looking at change point detection, 
we, we don't really have the tools available to us at the moment to be able to say, as I said, in a computationally efficient way, oh, only the trend is changing. Um, we can do that in, in a very um, ineffectual way and not in an online setting, um, but we, we don't really have the tools available to, to be able to just say, okay, I just want to look at the changes in the trend. And who knows, you know, you might not know that the, the, the trend is what might change. It might be the, the, you know, the intercept or it could be some of the seasonality parameters may, may vary um, over time. So being, having to have that constraint of being able to fit the model after the change point leads to the delays in, in detection of the change, poor model estimation because you've got a short segment following the change, um, the identifiability issues, because if you actually have two change points close together, um, maybe you know something around you know a behavior around a Christmas period that you want to automatically identify. You know, you don't want to just put in an aggressor just for the Christmas week. You might want to, to see well how what is the change around that. So you might want to put two aggressors quite close, you know, to identify an, a, a, a change or rather two changes um, sequentially in, in quite a short period of time that won't allow you to fit a seasonal model within that. If you've got long seasonals, seasonal frequencies like the yearly, you know, you, you can't fit just the Christmas period when you've got this yearly frequency with it within your model structure. So these are all kind of complicated things that, that we're thinking about in the change point context. If you don't have to fit the model after the change point, most of those methods um, are restricted to only detecting changes within um, mean or linear trend series. So you can't have any seasonalities in there. You can't have any regresses in, in your kind of um, model explanation. It needs to just be a, a flat mean series or a, or a flat trend, um, sorry, a linear trend series um, and no other components, which is, you know, from a practical perspective, very limiting. So they're the problems. So whilst I've kind of highlighted that, let me look at another allied problem here. So this is where the forecasting comes in. So if, if we have our original data as, as the first portion here, and this is just um, a, a flat mean um, with a, a little bit of um, ARIMA errors on it here. Um, so if, if we have kind of this data um, up until time 100 here, um, if we're doing a standard forecast of that of that data, then you know we've got some forecast error there coming on because we're, we're really just modeling the the core um, means you know the core mean structure here. We're not really following these these um, um, noise uh, very well here, which you know arguably might might be um, what you want to do. And then if you for, if you kind of take that model and you're forecasting it going into future, because it's, you know, it's not a bad model for, for this pre-change data here. You take that and, and you keep running with that model, forecasting with that model into the future. If at some point in the future there is a mean change in your data, then those forecasts are going to be biased. And we can see that here by the difference between uh, the new mean in the data and the mean of our forecasts. Similarly, it might not be the mean that might change. It might be some form of second order structure, so a variance or covariance uh, within the data stream. And so if that kind of happens, we've, we've got a similar um, initial data set here. And then as we move forwards, when that relationship changes, well, the mean, you know, the, there's not really a bias in my forecast at this point, but my um, um, confidence intervals, my forecast intervals uh, here are, are woefully inadequate, and it means that I'm, you know, I may be um, overconfident in, in my forecast um, going forwards, which can cause problem, a lot of problems, um, depending on the field that, that you're in. So both of these situations are, are very kind of similar to, to the change point problem that I was talking about, um, where you have a change point, uh, and you know, if, if you're not recognizing it, then it's going to cause a, a problem in, in your forecasts and the reliability of, of your forecasting. So in both of these scenarios, once we've had that change point, the difference between our forecasts and our data, you know, otherwise known as forecast error, here we here our forecast error has a, has a clear bias to it. Here it's not about the uh, bias in the area, but it's it's about the prediction intervals being being woefully inadequate. So this is kind of an allied problem because what we're looking at here is, is we are taking a model and we are forecasting and we're, and we're kind of wanting to know when our forecasts are, are not good enough, when there's been a change in the underlying process um, that means that our forecasts 
are just not suitable anymore. And so, as I've kind of said here, so um, there's many different causes of um, forecast degeneracy. Uh, some ones that I'm going to kind of talk about in or have in mind when I'm talking today is, is the mean changes, uh, having the forecast become biased, the variance where the prediction intervals and other types of changes that, that we've looked at um, will result in potential combinations of these. So if you're kind of looking at more uh, seasonality change where maybe you've got a changing amplitude or, or a changing intensity, um, then um, these these kind of have a, a combination of maybe some bias and, and also uh, inaccurate prediction intervals, depending on the type of uh, change that is, is within the raw data. So our aim in, in kind of looking at this um, problem, initially we kind of came from the point of view of, well, if we're wanting to detect changes close to the end of our time series or, or on, in an online fashion as, as new um, data is coming in, then we need to be dealing with that kind of short window after the change and, and the problems that come with estimating complex models within short um, within short amounts of data. And um, we, we also kind of came across this problem of uh, forecast degeneracy and, and how can you actually identify that um, within um, your forecast series. So both of them kind of come together because the solution for the both is, is in my mind the same. So essentially in, to get over the um, estimation of the, of the model after the, after the um, change point has been um, identified where, where you're trying to, you know, where you potentially have to estimate a complex model, instead of doing that, let's just use the forecast errors because the forecasts themselves will kind of, their aim is to take account of a lot of that variation. So the seasonal component and, and, and you know, any effective regresses and things like that, those will kind of be wiped out, stripped clean of, 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 the, um, of, of, the, of the data when you're kind of looking at the forecast errors, especially if you've just got a change in mean where, you know, it's essentially just a biased forecast. Um, and so at that point, we get rid of a lot of those model estimation problems following the change if we just look at forecast errors. And similarly, forecast errors is really what drives um, forecast degeneracy, in, in my view, where it's, it's when you see errors that are unusual over a, a period of time that would indicate to you that there may be something wrong with your forecast model. So, the, you know, our original aim and, and uh, use this forecast errors and then we we kind of realized that this was also a bonus with it within the um forecasting world to to look at forecasting performance so for those of you who don't really know what change points are um i've kind of waffled on and you and you may have switched off already but essentially um they're where you have um a structural change in in the underlying uh, generating generating model for for your data so this could be a mean change as we've kind of got here where, where the the kind of level increases a variance change as, as we kind of saw in that um, original time series um or a trend change or, or anything else really um can be a, a change point it's just where the statistical properties of the data are different prior to and post the the change point time so in online change points what people aim to do is to detect change points as quickly as possible so as soon as as soon as it's happened we want to be able to signal it but if we signal too quickly then if there's an outline within the data we will signal a change when actually the following time point that you get returns back to normal and um, so we need to minimize uh, the false alarms but also try and detect change points as quickly as possible and these are kind of the two competing aims um, that the online change points uh, estimation tries to balance. So typically the way that we'll kind of do this is, is we split um, the data into two phases, a bit like you do when, when you're creating forecasting models, you kind of have an initial phase where you estimate the model, and then you'll have a kind of testing phase where you will um, kind of produce forecasts and monitor the performance, the forecast performance of the model that you fit during the training period. So it's exactly the same here. We have a training period where we're assuming that there's no change points and we kind of estimate um, all of the parameters that we might be interested in. Maybe that's the mean or, or the variance um, or 
um, I don't know, the, the long run covariance or something like that. We estimate all of those things and then we can create a, a test statistic that will allow us during the modeling period, so uh, the monitoring period, so after the training period has ended, we kind of monitor the data as it arrives and say, is it statistically different from the original training period that, that we had? Okay. And there are many different um, measures that you can use or test statistics that you can use to, to um, assess whether a change has occurred. And um, one of the most popular is um, the QSUM detector or equally pages QSUM, which kind of is a combination of, of the QSUM detector um, it, with different um, windows on it. And this QSUM detector basically allows you to define a stopping rule um, that will appear on some of my graphs later, where the stopping rule is constant. And then as, as we kind of go into the future, um, it understands that there will be uh, random variation. And so it kind of increases uh, the stopping rule as, as we go into the future. And Pages QSUM tends to be more, um, cons uh, more less conservative than, than the original QSIM detector in real, real life examples. Okay, so this is kind of how you can um, create that uh, threshold um, is, is just the equation at the bottom. So how does that work in practice? So for example, I've got a dotted line here. This, this signifies the end of my training period. So in that first part of, of, of the data up until time 300, I'm basically learning my parameters, learning the structure of the data, just like you would do um, with the forecasting model where you're kind of building your forecasting model based on, on a period of data. Then as I go forward in time, I'm, I'm monitoring. So I'm, uh, the blue line here is, is my um, threshold for signifying that a change has occurred. And so um, it kind of increases slowly after, after the original time period to balance um, and maintain the, the overall type one error that, that we might want to um, have, or equally you can put, put it in terms of an average run length to false alarm. So if you want to have a false alarm no more than 100 observations, then that would be one value. Um, for this blue line, if you want it no more than 100,000 observations, that blue line would be higher uh, because you need to guard against uh, false alarms in a different way. Okay. And then at 400 here, we've got a change in mean in the data. And what we can see in the black line, which is um, our test statistic, uh, is that as soon as we, you know, as soon as we finish the monitoring period, there's some random variation coming through. And then when we hit the change point time, that's when we're increasing. And depending on the size of, of that change, we will increase faster or shallower, um, de um, just depending on that original change size. And so the difference between the, the bottom dip um, at 400 and when the, the black line clock crosses the blue line, that's what's called our detection delay. So here it's, it's about um, 25 observations, um, which depending on your context may be appropriate or not um, as you go through. And as I said, the QSUM tends to be a little bit more conservative. I'll show you some plots later, later on um, that demonstrate that. So that's kind of how the QSUM detector would work um, for a general time series where we're looking for, for a mean change. So how do we actually use that with our forecast errors? So essentially what, what we do is, is we just take our forecast errors and I should say at this point um, that you can do this for any forecast horizon that you want to. And um, we're going to do it for, for one step ahead forecast, but the, the same process works whether you're looking at two step ahead, 10 step ahead. And theoretically you could do a, a multivariate version where you, where you look at say one to 10 steps ahead, all kind of um, independently calculated as forecast errors and then kind of updated um, through time um, and analyzed multi, in a multivariate context. But we, I won't go into that here. So we calculate our forecast error, so it's basically our one step ahead forecast um, taken away from, from the true value that we observe at that time point. And you can see here um, the data at the top. Um, this is where we've got some seasonal components in. Uh, again, the dotted line at 300 is, is the end of our monitoring period. And then as, as we get to 400, we, we see that at 400, there's a mean shift. And so we're continuing the same pattern, um, but with a mean shift uh, in there. And you can see that through the difference in the blue line, which is our forecast. So we've got our forecast in blue, our data in black. And then the difference between those is, is just what's plotted on the middle graph there, where you're looking at the errors. And this is what I was saying earlier, that the, the forecasting aspect basically strips out all of that, that those seasonal components and we're just left with, with the error structure, which 
if, if assumptions are correct, um, in the majority of models would, would be normally distributed with um, mean zero and then some um, variance term. So this then, um, obviously, when we have a bias in our forecast, that mean is no longer zero anymore. And that's what's kind of giving us our ability to find the change point. So our QSIM detector at the bottom um, finds a change point after about 10 observations after, after the true change, um, which I, I hope you would agree would be a lot harder to, to identify in the original time series because you wouldn't know if, if that jump up was a mean shift or, or whether it was um, uh, just an, an outlying observation that is obviously, depending on the dependency structure, has affected quite a few observations following as well. So that's kind of how, how we, we, we look at this. Um, so in that sense, um, you might want to ask about variance changes. So similarly, um, so we have the same original data here, and then we've introduced a variance change at 400, which you can see here um, means that the prediction intervals are no longer um, um, reasonable for this data. Again, um, we're going to look at the forecast errors, but instead of looking at the just, just the errors here which would still have a mean zero we're going to look at the squared errors here because looking at the squared errors is 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 um basically akin to the the variance of your, of your forecast errors and so we're we're looking here and uh, the squared errors you can see there's a clear change here and when you you do the cumulative sum of those squared errors that then gives you again a, cro a crossing point um of around 415. so whilst it's a little bit easier to see the variance change within this specific example. Um, it's it, variance changes are notoriously harder to to detect um, than uh, mean changes. Um, and again, we can kind of see that the seasonal structure has been stripped out, and so so we're just left with um, the, these will be um, chi squared errors here. So it's all well and good me kind of giving you a few examples within the paper itself. We kind of go through the theory behind this of how. Um, we can be sure that these change points in the um, forecast errors are actually driven by changes in the original data structures. And we bring together um, a little bit of literature that's already available within certain circumstances and certain um, um, error structures, such as ARIMA error errors here. One of the best things that, that I kind of have glossed over here is that the wonderful thing about using forecast errors is that you can be agnostic as to how those forecasts are generated. So depending, you know, you can use ML models, you can use neural nets, you can use ETS, you know, wh whatever you want to, whatever you want to use there, we're agnostic to that. And um, the key thing is that you believe that the forecast that you're creating is representative of, of the series that, that you're modeling originally. Um, and then we will basically detect any deviations in that. So if your original forecast model is, is not really appropriate kind of from a longer term perspective, and it's just, you know, it's the best thing that you can fit on that short term perspective, we'll, we'll be able to detect that as, as we get more data coming through as well, that, that basically the model that you've chosen is, is not appropriate. So I've, I've kind of said about both QSIM and the, the QSIM of the squared forecast errors, so clearly the, the QSIM of the raw forecast errors is, is looking at first order properties. And then the QSIM of the second uh, of the squared forecast errors is looking at more second order changes. So more your variance and covariance um, structures coming through there. It can also detect mean changes as well, just by the nature of, of the fact that mean changes will translate through into the squared forecast errors. Um, but it, we do show in the paper that actually it's more accurate to use the QSIM of the raw forecast errors um, going forwards. So I just want to kind of give you a couple of examples here. So one here is um, the a and &E admissions. So this is kind of the original data that I showed with no um, axis and things. So we can kind of see that there's trend within the data. Um, if, if we look at it um, more closely, there's, there's um, well, we use an ARIMA model structure um, on the errors and the seasonality coming through here as well um, with the 12 months of, of the year. With, um, so it's monthly data here. And so you can imagine that, you know, if, if you're looking at this in a sequential manner, you're wanting to, you know, you've already, for every month that you have, um, where your forecasts are incorrect, you're, you're losing um, 
money, you're losing time, you're losing efficiency. Um, and so because the data is monthly, it, it can be very challenging um, to have long detection delays uh, for this type of, of data. Um, if I was wanting to kind of model this, because I've got a yearly frequency here, if I was actually using a model-based change point approach here, then I would have to wait at least a year after the change point to be able to identify it, which I hope you, you can agree is, is not appropriate for, for, this sorts of, um, for these sorts of data structures. So this is AE emissions with the gallstone pathology, so it's not the, the total a &E admissions at all. And the um, department is, is basically using this information to be able to predict um, admissions. And if they can predict admissions um, you know, at, at some level of accuracy, then they will be able to schedule elective surgeries and other things for more quieter periods um, of the year. So typically gallstone um, pathology can be very sudden and need emergency care, but it can also be longer term where they have more elective surgeries where somebody would need to have surgery say within the next year or so. And so being able to schedule that at quieter periods um, through the year is, is helpful for, for their planning um, and, and that sort of purposes. So we trained on, on the data up until 2016. Uh, then, then we, we run the um, algorithm forwards and we detect a change um, just uh, at the beginning of 2017. And um, this has been verified by a, an offline change. Well, I say verified, you can't really verify real changes in real data. But um, what I mean is, is the change point is exactly the same as if I actually managed to do a fully accurate analysis. So the, the, um, the data set is small enough because it's just monthly data that I can brute force um, an, an approach that will fit just a change in trend. And this is the change point that, that it would come up with. So that kind of gives you know, some kind of um, the, a weak validation that, that what we're doing using the forecast errors would give you the same answer as if you, as if you were doing the, the model based approach in this example. Um, so the change point, yeah, it's just after 2017 and, and it's only a couple of uh, like two observations afterwards where we detect the change, which is, is reasonable for this um, data set. So then um, the Royal Mail um, example was the, they, they were kind of the motivating um, set for, for this project. And this is um, the, num the TTP project. So it's the number of parcels delivered um, from a, for each delivery office. And they need to forecast the number of parcels that need to be delivered. Uh, this is one such um, delivery office here. And every year um, they have a Christmas rush, as you might expect, but that's when the Christmas staff will start, uh, is kind of when the Christmas rush comes in. Um, and so the Christmas rush is at different times in of the year in different delivery offices. And so they need an, an algorithm that can automatically detect when, when the start of this uh, Christmas rush has begun, and also maybe um, look at predicting this longer term as to whether the Christmas rush is the same across years and things like that. But that's not really what, what we're looking at um, in this uh, data set. So we train on the period up, into, up until November. We've, we've tried lots of different, um, I should say, there's um, only the forecast errors are shown here, not the original data, nor the forecast provided by Royal Mail. Um, there's much data, much more data going further back, but I kind of just wanted to zoom in on, on this period here. So we train up until November. We tried other training dates as well with, with very similar um, results coming through. And then we run it forwards again. And um, the peak, the first kind of peak that we see um, at the beginning of December, that's kind of all of the, um, for this delivery office, it's, it's all of the um, Black Friday deals and, and typically when they are being delivered uh, in the first week of December. Um, so both the QSUM and the QSUM squares detect this very, very quickly. Um, if we look at another delivery office, um, you have a different picture going on here. There's more variability in, in general. Um, and the um, I've, I've shown a little bit more of the data here. And the um, methods kind of give you um, slightly different results coming here as to when that Christmas rush starts, whether it's the QSUM or the QSUM squared. Um, they're kind of both saying that, that well, they're both detect it on the 4th of December, um, but the origin is, is different depending on whether you look at the QSUM or the QSUM squared. So whether it's a mean change or, or a variance change. And um, 
I would look at the first series and say it was a variance change, but, but maybe there's a, a small mean change in there as well. So looking at kind of both of these, you, you might say, oh, well, actually, I want to detect the, the mid-November huge shift that, that we have here in, in the variance, and this may be um, the, um, the control limits that are set here are, are too conservative. And so because the, um, the kind of theoretical assumptions that are behind those control limits are usually violated because, you know, it's real data, um, we, we can instead um, look at simulating from the forecasting model and, and um, creating 95% uh, quantiles, uh, kind of a, a bootstrapped threshold um, instead of looking at the other one. And if we do that, then, then it's, it's much lower and we do detect that, that earlier change um, in the uh, squared Q sums um, that results from um, the increase in variance that we see at the beginning of November. So just to kind of conclude there, let, I'll let Nikos kind of take over. So this kind of project is twofold. One, it allows people who want to be able to do offline change point analysis and um, to be able to use forecast errors to be able to avoid the um, challenges that, that come with complex model structures. Um, and similarly, it, it can be used in an online context um, to detect deterioration in, in our forecast performance. Um, and that's kind of been shown in, in a few of our examples here. Um, so this is available on GitHub. I'm, I should have put a link in, apologies. I, I'll put it into the chat in, in a minute when Nico starts talking. And, um, and feel free to try it out if you like it. You know, you can always suggest um, improvements and model structures. And um, we are moving to multivariate forecasts as well soon, um, and maybe consider some alternative uh, online change point methods rather than the QSUM as well. So, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, virtual applause. So, <laughs> Nikos, I think it's over to you. Uh, take, let's say, five minutes or so. <laughs> With your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca, for the presentation. Uh, I, I did mention that in passing before, not in this uh, uh, in this slot, but uh, in previous communications, that uh, I think it's an important topic that we often forget. We forget that the data do change actually, and there are issues there. Um, however, I'm supposed to do the devil's advocate, so I will take the hat. I don't like it. <laughs> let me let me say why. Uh, what are aspects that I would like to get a bit more of your views? Um, if I'm thinking how, for instance, forecasting happens in many organizations, indeed, they have a ton of forecast to produce, and then they say, let's set up the forecasting system, and then we keep on producing for several iterations of the forecasting cycle with the same models, fixed parameters. But as companies get more data science teams in-house, in or they get access to more advanced software, now models often either we estimate the parameters or even are fully specified from period to period. So I'm wondering, as you end up having these changes in the data structure, and I'm not saying if you specify the model, everything is great, but how relevant is in some sense the anomaly detection? And even if we have the anomaly detection, what does it actually mean for our forecasting process? Do you want me to answer? <laughs> so I fully appreciate, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people, when we've assumed that, that you're going to have a static model, and um, we also have, have used it with um, um, exponential smoothing models, which clearly, you know, update their parameters as they go through time. And um, so that kind of shows that, yes, even if that, so for some forecasting models, they're better at kind of adapting to changes that are inherent with the data than others. Um, if you're not interested in the changes and you're only interested in, in making accurate forecasts, then you should be using one of those that does, does it do the adaptation, but maybe that also is adapting too quickly or still will maybe is adapting, but isn't adapting fast enough. So if it's not adapting fast enough, then our method will tell you that um, because it will have enough observations before the adaptions occurred that it will tell you that something is wrong. And you might just go, oh, well, it's going to, you know, it just needs a little bit longer to adapt. That's fine. Fair enough. And um, the other side is, well, maybe you want to know that there has been a change. You know, you, you, may, you might not be content to just say, oh, my forecasting model has automatically adjusted to this. Maybe a change in the 
in the for in in the modeling that you're doing for the time series might mean a huge thing to your business it de really depends on the context as you know if if for example um my um let's kind of do, I, I like to use this kind of like ice ice cream example so ice cream is very seasonal in terms of their sales but they also have kind of change points because over time, a lot of people have um, moved away from ice cream as they think it's unhealthy and have moved more towards buying sorbet. And so if, if you're only interested in your total sales, then that, you know, that may not make a difference. But if you're interested in actual, you know, making long term strategic decisions about um, the kind of ongoing relationship between consumers and certain products, then you might want to know that that change has taken place because just the fact that your models have been updated and your forecasts are now forecasting lower might not trigger in somebody's mind that that means that they need to change their strategy. So I do think it really depends on the context of the series and what you're doing with the forecast. But I think there's still places where this type of modeling um, is appropriate and relevant where the changes are important to be noted. I will first pick up on your answer and say that I certainly hope our society progress further that ice cream consumption will become constant and non-seasonal. <laughs> and the second element you, you mentioned here was an understanding of the change. And that actually leads to the, my next point. Um, and I was looking at the audience for econometricians just to you know make some people's boil, uh, blood boil a bit. But it, the eternal discussion in econometrics has been, is that a structural change or an outlier or whatever it is? And in some sense, I can see how the algorithms that you described or the methodology you described in some sense could go towards that direction. Someone would say, okay, here is a shift in the mean or here's a shift in the variance. And someone would say, if you don't tell me why, it's not informative because I don't know what to do in the regression. I personally would disagree with that. But I would still have the question of saying, suppose something happens and your, your, your technique would pick it up. But then there is another shift. And then you say, all right, was that now an outlier or, or what not? So where I'm getting with all that, I'm not looking of saying, okay, in this case it will work, in this case it will not work. But if if we don't really know the ground truth, in simulated data, of course we'll know, but in real data, we'll never know the ground truth. My personal perception is if I don't know the ground truth, the ultimate test is a predictive test, you know, the, in the classical scientific, uh, let's say, upbringing. But in, in our case, if I would say there is a change, I need to put it in the model. How do I know actually that is not overfitting and it's actually giving me an intuition? I'm going more, if I don't care about predictive accuracy only, and I care about getting the right functional form of what I'm modeling, do I really know by introducing changes I'm doing that? Or is there any way I could gain confidence in that? You see my kind of concern here. Yeah, so I think that's kind of link, leaking back in, into what the field calls offline change, and up, change point analysis. So that's where the kind of the aim is, is in making sure that the best model is, is picked and um, not just the one that gives the best forecast accuracy. And so as part of that, the, the aim is to make sure that change points are detected when they benefit the, the fit of the model to, to the data. It, you can characterize that whatever way you want to. Um, and then you're kind of looking at, um, well, I may have signaled in my kind of online setting that there's been a change in the underlying model structure that means that my forecasts are not, are not good anymore. I don't see that as kind of giving you the whole answer. I see that as giving you the first step to say, you need to look into this because something has changed. Then you would kind of come and you would ha maybe have a secondary process that would maybe run another type of analysis if you're interested in what has changed that will then help you decide why it's changed potentially. Um, but I, I always see the different phases and you know, change point analysis can be used in many different ways and at many different levels. Um, so within computer networks, for example, you want a really super fast thing to say, yes, there might be an intrusion here. Um, and then you kind of go to the next level to say, well, that could, you know, I've got a very high false alarm rate at my first level so that I make sure I don't miss anything. And then that goes to the second level that is kind of more accurate. And I kind of see the same thing with this stuff here where, where you're saying, okay, I'm doing my online thing and may set it so it's got actually quite a high false alarm rate if I wanted to. And then that would trigger a, sec a second type of process, which would say, actually, what has changed and when did it change? Because, you know, if, the other side of things is 
if your forecast accuracy is is you know drifting very slowly it could be a long time after the change until you actually identify it because that you know that slow drift it doesn't become a problem until you're very far away from from where you currently are so things like that will will allow you to um say well actually that change was two years ago i really don't care about that <laughs> you know if, it, if, it, if it's some slow drift and um, so having those different levels of of um of analysis, I think, is really, really important to any problem. Do we have time to raise a third point, uh, Ivan? If it is a short one, then yes. <laughs> so one aspect that I always, again, connecting a bit to practice in practice, they are, we may be developing more and more sophisticated processes and by definition, the same way, a bit better algorithms in forecasting, but still the behavioral aspect remains key. And the reason is because it can give us also information on why change is happening or why there is some outlier or shock anyway in the whole process. So um, um, one aspect that the literature has found several, in several different papers is that these uh, this mental adjustments are inconsistent. Sometimes they do great, sometimes they do less great. And currently a lot of work that has happened in Lancaster has been to show actually that the difficulties in people identifying the information that is relevant, what are the cues that suggest a particular adjustment should happen, either in terms of timing or in terms of direction, size, and so on. So I was more or less thinking about the work you've been doing and thinking, can this be in some sense um, used to supplement the behavioral adjustment? So when I work, for instance, that uh, uh, Robert has done in the past with judgmental bootstrapping has been to say, can we take the, the adjustment as an indication and then use those to build a regression model of sorts or something like that to build a, a more objective uh, adjustment system. And now I'm thinking, could we use actually a system like that uh, to somehow inform experts that, oh, something is happening or vice versa, something is not happening? And, you know, the, the apparent answer is yes. But here is where I'm getting a bit more confused. Um, it has a delay and there is where things get messy. It has always a delay and also experts are a bit not so informed in how to adjust for the second moment, uh, so the variance aspect. So I was wondering if, if you could think of any way you could potentially use all that to inform the experts accounting for the lag in the information and also that experts are pretty good at understanding variance. And that's my last comment, then it goes to the audience. <laughs> that, that, that is an interesting question. As, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking, oh, this could actually be really interesting to kind of go into a consensus forecasting where you're kind of trying to weight the different um, forecasts that, that you've got within, you know, to try and come up with a consensus forecast. Because if one of them is is kind of going off and is, is you know, not reflecting the truth anymore, you can just discount it completely without having to do, you know, put that into your weighting metric. Anyway, but then you kind of flipped it and you went with, okay, well, how can we use this to inform the experts? And that's really interesting. Um, I don't. I, I. I. think I don't know enough about um, the kind of processes that go into it to decide. But I'm guessing that you could. You could do the same thing by making them aware that the variances are increasing. But the problem comes. You wouldn't then want to give them the the kind of the change point side. You want to give them the raw the raw kind of trend because you can see the uptick in 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 the trend of the test statistic way before you hit the before you hit the threshold so some you know over time some of those experts will kind of go okay well oh there's a little uptick here so maybe that means that you know my variance is increasing slightly so i need to adjust my um forecast and then they adjust their forecast so then the the uptick then becomes a down a down tick again and th and then you're suddenly there like oh well that didn't manifest <laughs> and you start yes it didn't manifest because you because you took a decision which changed the process or changed your forecast process anyway so yeah it's, it's interesting but i i would envisage that you could use the the um trace of the test statistic to help inform them a little bit about that okay thanks uh, for the interesting discussion nikos for the interesting questions and uh, answers rebecca do we have any questions from the audience I have a very quick question. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Kelly, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, was there any work done around uh, using change point detection for earthquake uh, detection? Because that's uh, the concern there, of course, is that you know, you'd like to give a 
warning as early as possible. At the same time, uh, you want like too many false alarms. Uh, yes, there, there has been work in change points and um, and earthquake detection. Um, I haven't looked at it recently, actually, as as, a, as an application area, but I, I do know that that um, change point detection is used in that context. But I'm not I'm not 100% sure what methods they're currently using to do that. But I don't think they use forecast errors. From is, my... is there any peculiarity in 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 such uh, situations? Anything yes, to... yes, oh. be because you, you essentially there you're looking at the changes in in the oscillations. And so you've got your whole frequency distribution is, is changing. So that's really interesting from, from the kind of point of view that, you know, you'll have general rumblings where the frequency distribution will change. And so that will trigger a change point to go from dormant to a kind of rumbling at that point. And then it's about, well, how can you detect the differences? You know, once you've got past that rumbling point, how do you know the differences between that going forward? And that requires a combination of change points and classification, whereby you're you're kind of saying, well, is this point for you know, I, I'm going to say I've got a change point. Let, let's just say I've done that, and I then say, okay, well, the data after the change point, what structure does it look like? And so you, you'll have different traces from when okay. maybe that volcano or similar volcanoes and um, or other um sorry I was looking at volcanic eruptions they're not talking about earthquakes but um you know you'll you'll have similar previous data that you'll have a look at and then you'll kind of classify that developing time series into one of one of those classes based on that. That's usually what what you would be looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question from the uh, from Salvatore Kissi, how can we incorporate the structural changes into the future forecasts? Uh, that's just in the same way you would kind of do any modeling. So it, it's really up to you. If you believe in the exact change point location, you can just put a regressor in for that going forwards. Um, you would have to obviously then understand, well, what what is it? What has changed? So if it's the mean change, that's easy. You can just put a, a level shift regressor in. If it's a trend, that's also quite easy. If it if it's a seasonality that's changed, then maybe you need to do something a little bit more sophisticated with that. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is another question from Nikki, and it's a bit uh, tricky, but maybe you will understand it better than I do. How long are the lags for the information about the change in the data, usually for yearly, monthly, daily? Okay, so the interesting thing there is it all depends on the type of change you're looking at um, and the size of that change. So whether it's yearly, monthly or daily data, kind of, it almost doesn't matter because as I said earlier in the talk, your, your forecast is kind of stripping out all of that information that's there. So if you have a change in the mean structure, then you know a, a level shift in, in, in your model um, or in, in, the, um, in the data source, then that's normally, a, you know, the, the larger the shift, the quicker you'll, you'll identify it. Uh, with the variance, again, it's, it's the larger the change in variance, the quicker you'll identify it. When you're looking at changes in seasonal structure, it will then depend on kind of how, where you are in the seasonal cycle and how significant a change is at that point in the seasonal cycle. So if it's a huge change at that point in the seasonal cycle, then you'll see it immediately. But if there's not really a change in that part of the seasonal cycle, you might have to wait until another part of the seasonal cycle to be able to actually see this, the change, which kind of comes to the point where, you know, where do we say a change point is when we're kind of talking about that? Um, there's, there's obviously, if, the, if a certain part of the seasonal cycle is the same in, in kind of before and after the change, and maybe it's, it's just that, um, you know, in certain months you, you've got an increase or, or a decrease, um, then obviously there's a lot of uncertainty over where that change point will have occurred at that point. Um, but as, so, as soon as you've got um, cumulative information that is, is kind of large enough, um, that's when a change point will be triggered. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have run out of time. So let's thank everyone, uh, Rebecca, for her interesting presentation. Let's also thank uh, Nikos for his uh, insightful comments. And thank you all for coming and joining us. And hopefully next time we will have a better technology for the uh, webinar, not that. Or, or you just have a speaker that's not on Linux. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for no, your, your participation. Okay.
Good. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.